guys hear me? I got up here pretty quick. Just got warm in the pew. <laughs>
came over and she says, wow, you have the same, same jewelry as me. And she says, yes, my husband worked and he got us, got me this jewelry and now, you know, it's so beautiful and so clean. And the friend asked, how much did that cost? And she told the price and her friend said, wow, that's amazing because mine's fake. <laughs> you guys get that? You get yeah. that? <clears throat> yeah. Envy and jealousy can take us places where we do not want to go. We're going to be in James 4. I'm going to give you a little recap, and then we're up to James 3, and then we'll get started. We're going to be talking about jealousy and envy. Now, last week we discussed knowledge and wisdom. What we learned was that wisdom is applying the knowledge you have. James showed us that true faith is evidenced through godly wisdom. Either you have wisdom that is from above, which is pure, gentle, you know, willing to yield free from hypocrisy, or you have this earthly wisdom that is filled with jealousy and just selfish ambition. Earthly wisdom leads to disorder and it's demonic, as James said in chapter three. Satan tempted Adam and Eve to sin against God and the result was death for all. They used earthly wisdom and now the whole entire world will die and they will need a savior. Today we will be in chapter four and there's a debate on rather the beginning of chapter four should be a part of chapter three because in chapter four, James is still rebuking the sinful uh, attitudes that lead to decisions, dissensions. But I believe in chapter four, James is giving an example of what he has been talking about in chapter three. James does that a lot. He, he, he gives a lot of, he talks about a subject and then he gives examples. If you probably remember, if you've been with us through this study, um, there was an example of someone blaming God for their temptations. And there was an example of someone not giving food and clothing to, to those in need. These were real situations. And so any good pastor is going to give application, and James gave a lot of application. I, the only difference is James actually talked about real situations with real people in the church. And if you're going into ministry, I wouldn't suggest talking about people's business from the pulpit. Uh, that might not work for you. If it does work for you, it works for you. But it definitely worked for James. Now, James is going to go more in depth into the disorder he brought up in the lower half of chapter 3. And that's where we're going to pick up. Chapter 4. James 4. Let's read verses 1 to 3. What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source your pleasures that wage war in your members? You lust and do not have, so you commit murder. You are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive, because you ask with wrong motives, so that you may spend it on your pleasures. Let's pray. Lord, I just thank you that uh, we continue to be changed every time we come to this book of James. And Lord, I just ask you to do that also today. Uh, Lord, I just pray that your word will touch us, that we'll be changed by it, uh, that our ears will be open to it, that we will not say, or we will not think of other people, but we will think of ourselves and put ourselves in this situation and look for ways or any ways that we are doing the things that James says that we shouldn't be going in this text. Lord, be with us, be with those who do not know you, Lord, that their eyes will be open, their ears will be open today, their hearts will be open to you. And be with your children, those who profess to know you, that we will reflect in our lives what we say with our mouths. I ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. In John 13, 34 through 35, I think I have the slide up there for you. This is Jesus speaking. He says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. You see, love was not a new commandment, really in the sense of being a brand new teaching, but there was a new standard. The standard was to love each other as Christ has loved us. And that love would be proof that we had the Holy Spirit living in us, that we really were disciples. Loving like Jesus 
as loving unto greater love to the point of laying down your life. But another interesting point about this, this text right here, this commandment of love given by Jesus, is that he is actually talking about the love between disciples. When we discuss love, we're usually talking about love for our neighbors and others who, who, who do not know God. Yet Jesus says a strong evangelism tool for all men to see will be the love we show each other. Other believers. Galatians 6, 10 through 10 says, So then while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people and especially to those who are of the household of the faith. The point is the one who loves God should love his or her, her believing brother or sister in Christ. Yet, as the saying goes, we hurt those closest to us. Many churches are often characterized by conflict. There's a philosopher, a Jewish philosopher, uh, named Spinoza, Benedict D. Spinoza, from the 17th century, and he said this about Christian churches. I'll read it for you. I had it. He says, I have often wondered that persons who make a boast of professing the Christian religion, namely love, joy, peace, and charity to all men, should quarrel with such rancorous animosity and display daily towards one another such bitter hatred. He goes on to say this, that this rather than the virtues they claim is the readiest criterion of their faith. What he's saying is that those who love God and profess to know God, what we know that's not debatable is they love to bicker among themselves. You see, the tongue boasts of great things, though it is really, it really is small. James told us that. The churches around the world known for conflict may have done a lot of great things for the community. I know they have. I'm sure they've done more good than that. But James hits the nail on the head when he says the tongue is a small fire that can destroy an entire forest. All the good you've done in your life can be destroyed by words of conflict. So the image of the church and the community is marred when the tongue is used for conflict between members. So in chapter 4, James puts his behavioral psychologist hat on. He says he wants us to see why we do what we do. He told us in the last chapter some things that we should do, some practical things we should do. But now he's saying this is why you do what you do. Now, both words in, in the text, quarrels and conflicts, can be used to describe physical altercations. But the words can also be used for verbal altercate, altercations. And we know this because Paul tells Titus to avoid quarrels about the law and conflict about the law. So here's the point. There could have been some fist fights among the members James is writing to. I mean, can you imagine that small group meeting or that church potluck? Someone just barely punching someone in the face? That would never happen here, right? You better say amen, right? Okay. Don't punch All right. Come on, guys. All right. Uh, we do not know what the argument was over. But we do see the connection that James is trying to teach on. When there is selfish ambition and envy, there can only be disorder. I, I'm, as I was thinking of this and preparing this message, I was reminded of the story of, of Jesus and the disciples and the topic of greatness. Two of the disciples asked Jesus, please make it so we can sit on your left and your right in the kingdom. And Jesus said, all right, are you sure you can handle what you're asking for? And they replied, yes. And Jesus said, okay, you will experience suffering. You will bear your cross. And Jesus was right about that. But to sit on my left and my right is not up to me, but for the Father who has prepared it. So after this, the other disciples, after they hear this, they're all mad and they're envious of each other. You see, when there is selfish ambition and envy, there can only be disorder. The other disciples were mad because the brothers, uh, James and John, not this James here, another James, had the audacity to ask Jesus, can we sit on your left and your right? But they were also mad because they didn't ask first. And Jesus, knowing this, says in Mark 10, 43 through 45, but it is not this way among you, but whoever wishes to become great among you 
shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. So the point is, Jesus is teaching the, desi the disciples that their desires need to be renewed. A renewing of the mind. Selfish ambition and envy means sacrifice and self-denial, and also a love that is willing to die for others. Look at your text. It says, is not the source your pleasures that rage, wage war in your members? That word pleasures is also the word for desires. Hate and I. It's where we get the word hedonism. This word is always, always used in a negative sense in the New Testament. If you have the New King James Bible, it says, desires for pleasure that war in your members. So it says, is not the source desires for pleasures that war in your members? The Christian is a soldier fighting a war against the enemy, the devil, and the flesh. The enemy lives inside of the camp. The enemy is our flesh, and so in the Bible, the flesh refers to our mind, our body, and our will, our motives, before redemption, because it's all affected by sin. In Galatians 5, 17, it says, For the flesh sets its desire against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. So the point here is that James is saying is that the sources of all your pools and conflicts is your wicked desires for selfish ambition and jealousy towards each other. Look at verses 2 to verses 3. You lust and do not have, so you commit murder. You are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and pull. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. And some of your Bibles may say desires. There's a saying that all frustrations, are birthed by unmet expectations. Here we see desires, and those desires are not being met. If you think back on times when you've become frustrated, it's because you expected things to go another way. Think about traffic jams, driving through, you know, going, driving through the drive-through and getting the wrong food, coworkers, and, and, and so on. Frustrations are birthed by unmet expectations. Your frustrations lead to anger. And when we're angry, anything is possible. James 1.20, he's already told us that for the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. James says you lust, you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but can't get what you want, so you fight. Each desire leading to fight, wars, and even murder. Even murder. Scripture tells us in Mark 15.10 that Pilate, he knew that the chief priests wanted to crucify Jesus because of envy. They hated that Jesus had followers. You know, sometimes we cannot see the envy in ourselves, but other people can see it. Many times in Acts, jealousy was attributed to why the apostles were thrown in jail and beaten. Do not think that you are above the places that selfish ambition and envy can take you. Each and every person here in this room has the ability to get angry and so angry that it takes over and you could, and, and that anger could turn the sweetest person into a killer. To be angry and not sin is a hard task. But by the Holy Spirit, if you're a Christian, you have the Holy Spirit, you have the power to do it. You have the power to be angry and to not sin. You know, it's all by his grace that many of us are not in jail right now. Now, why the frustration for the members James is writing to? They have selfish ambition and envy. We just cleared that up. Their desires, they have selfish ambition, and they're angry. They're not attaining the things they want, and so they kill and they covet. But that's not the only thing that's going on in this church. They also have a praying problem. It says, you do not have because you do not ask God. God is the, the ultimate father. He loves his children and he desires relationships so much with us that he gave us prayer. He tells us to ask him and to keep on asking him. You have to ask yourself, do you take your concerns, your problems, or your decision-making to God? 
As a child of God, are you praying about everything? And I mean everything. You may not have. You may not have. There's a possibility you may not have because you do not ask. Maybe you think the thing that you need in your life is too big of a task for the Lord. God says, ask me. Jesus says, what type of father gives his son a stone when he asks for a loaf of bread? He says, if we know how to give good gifts and we are evil, surely God who is good will give us what we need. Trusting God for salvation, but also for everyday life. We serve a living God whose mercies are new every day. Not a God that checks in every once in a while. Sometimes I think we should call ourselves evangelical deists. Now, you know, deists believe God created the world and then he left us alone. And we reject that in every way because it's just foolish. But we believe God saves us and then that's all we get. So that makes us evangelical deists in a sense. There's so much more after salvation and we're going to speak about that in a little bit. I hear all the time, Christians aren't praying. I believe that is true. Um, Christians aren't praying. But there are some Christians who are praying. They pray every day. But James, and James speaks about that. He says, you ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that we can spend it on our desires. Some of your Bibles will say pleasures. That same word is desires. You see, God knows what we need before we ask him. He answers our prayers according to his will for us. And much of our prayers are financial or they're geared towards not having any frustrations. Much of our prayers are for the building up of our kingdom and not his. And so Jesus tells us, pray this, not that. <laughs> Jesus tells us, I'm the boy, you guys, if you haven't attended this church before, um, <laughs> everyone else will tell you, I am dangerous with this thing right here. <laughs> this is what Jesus wants us to pray. Pray your kingdom come, your will be done. I hope you write this down. A mark of a Christian is one who is so bought in to being a citizen of the kingdom of God that their prayers are filled with desires for the kingdom. A mark of a Christian is one who is so bought into being a citizen of the kingdom of God that their prayers are filled with desires for the kingdom. James now turns from his analysis of the problems to getting to the heart of the problem. In fact, I believe this is the heart of the entire letter. There are many who profess Christ, but are practicing spiritual adultery. Look at verse 4. You adulterers, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God? Or do you think that the scripture speaks to no purpose? He jealously desires the spirit which he has made to dwell in us. Jesus, while on earth, he often called the people in adulterous generation. He says, an adulterous generation seeks after a sign. And then he says, an adulterous generation is ashamed of me and my works in Mark 8, 38. So you have to ask yourself, why such a strong accusation such as adultery? Here we see the heart of God for his people in the heart of this letter. To do this, I want to draw just really quick from John the Apostle of love. John the Apostle, who just has this outburst of love for God, when he reflects on God's love for us, says this in 1 John 3, 1. See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us. John says, God bestowed his love on us. What is he talking about? No one says, I bestow my love on you. Bestow means to present someone with something during an event. So the closest thing we have to bestowing love during an event as humans would be marriage. A man and woman love each other, but there comes a time when they summon all of their love for each other and they stand before heaven and earth and authorities and parents and they give their love in a way that changes the course of their lives forever. You see, God joined himself with the people of Israel. He graciously elects Israel and brings them into a covenant relationship with himself. 
Isaiah, Isaiah, um, what is it? Isaiah, this powerful. Right here, Isaiah 54, 5. For your husband is your maker, whose name is the Lord of hosts, and your redeemer is the Holy One of Israel, who is called the God of all the earth. You see, God saves Israel from Egypt so he can be with them. I mean, as soon as the Lord builds the tab the tabernacle is built, God fills it. It's like he's anxiously standing outside, just, just waiting. As soon as they're done, he fills the tabernacle. And in the sight of all Israel is their God. They can see their God. What more could you possibly ask for? Well, a lot. Israel was never satisfied. Never staying in awe of God. They worshipped other gods and other worldly things and worldly systems. Israel is the bride and God is their husband. They consistently commit adultery. Jeremiah 2.20 says, For long ago I broke your yoke and tore off your bonds. But you said, I will not serve. For on every high hill and under every green tree, you have laid down as a harlot. God is saying, after all I did for you, you cheat on me. I kept you worshiping other gods all the time. How many of us profess our love to God, yet he keeps finding us at another's house? We have no time for him, and we, we even pray to God to bless us with money that we can spend on our other gods. We are no better than Israel. We all have our high heels or our green tree where we play the harlot against God. Now, God has the prophet Hosea marry a prostitute and to have children with her to depict the relations between God and his people. See, even though Israel plays the harlot, God is still faithful saving them, you know, keeping his covenant with them. And then he sends Jesus Christ, really proving his love and faithfulness by dying for our sins so we can be with him forever. And this time, he does not dwell in a tabernacle. He dwells inside of us because he wants to be near us. So going back to bestow in marriage, man and woman summon all of their love and they give it to each other in front of heaven and earth and authorities. And this love changes the course of their lives forever. God's love, the same and much more. Marriage is a picture of the love between the Trinity and for us. So God loves everyone. But if you're a Christian, there was a point in time when God bestowed his love in a special way to you, and it changed you, and then he moved in with you, and you dwell together. He jealously, look at verse 5, he jealously, jealously desires the spirit which he has made to dwell in us. God has a claim on us. What man will allow his wife to be wooed by another? How much more with God? Anything that gets in the way of our affections for him, he wants it out of our lives. He wants us to desire him and him alone. And this is a good thing. See, this is holy jealousy. This is righteous jealousy because there is nothing more desirable than him. James is saying if we say we love God, but we have strong affections for the world and his systems, we are adulterers. If you know